I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Helen to this conference today. Um, I first came across her when Vivian uh, brought her computer to me and said, you need to look at this. And it was an item in the British Pilgrimage Trust website, which Helen had posted there, which described her daily pilgrimage in Orkney during lockdown. And for me, it was truly inspirational. It really got us back to uh, gatekeeper work, uh, walking in the landscape on a regular basis, getting to know the landscape, the plants and the animals, and looking at the weather and everything else. It was truly inspirational. So when Louise and I were talking together about getting speakers for this conference, Helen was on, on my list, and I'm delighted that she accepted the offer to uh, speak today. Helen and her husband uh, have a business called Sacred Orkney in the Orkney Islands, where they are guides, photographers, authors, you name it, celebrants, the whole range of things, including, quotes, good company, unquote. So I'd like to hand over to Helen, and she's going to talk about Orkney, the original Golden Isle. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here today. Um, my title of my talk is um, Orkney, the Old Golden Land. Um, for those of you who are fools, um, uh, which have got a little bit sort of like spooky, um, this is kind of like a little bit of a nod to Phil Rickman. Um, I just want to, I just want to introduce who I am. Um, I, 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 I kind of like I'm one of those people that when you invite them to dinner parties, uh, if you want people to stay off religion and politics, you don't invite me um, because I'm the co-convener of the Orkney Greens and I'll be standing next year as a, a local government candidate. Um, I was really most worried about that today, but actually listening to you lot, you're all on board with green politics, so I'm not that nervous anymore. I'm also currently the deputy president of the Scottish Pagan Federation. Um, I work as a self-employed celebrant tourist guide. Um, everybody in Orkney has more than one job, and that's what you do. Um, I was the co-lead when um, the Orkney Heritage Society put in a memorial to the historic victims of the witchcraft trials, and I'm currently the co-lead of Orkney's um, Young Archaeology Club. And I'm trying to tell you these things now because I'd rather you found out about them now rather than find out about them later, you know. Oh, I had no idea she was that, you know, that would be awful. So anyway, here's Orkney, because um, this is not a Scottish accent and this is not a, definitely not an Orkadian accent. I moved here 12 years ago and what you've got is a Pompey accent. Uh, um, geographically challenged like I was when I used to live in the south of England. Um, it's north of London. OK, um, down here at the bottom of the map is Scotland. What we, we refer to that is just South. Uh, there's a real sense in Orkney that we're Orcadian. Um, it's a separate sort of um, sense of, of, of where we are. Uh, we're Orcadian first rather than Scottish or British. Um, there's 70 islands that make up the archipelago. We're a little bit south of Shetland. Um, there's 20 of the islands that are inhabited. I live on the largest island, which is called Mainland. Um, and Mainland is split into West and East Mainland. So when we talk about Mainland, we're talking about this main island in Orkney. We're not talking about Scotland. And I've just put also, I've just put where I live. I live about here. So I live just in the vicinity of a World Heritage Site. But the further thing you need to know about Orkney is it's between where the Atlantic Ocean and the North Sea meet, and they literally meet, and they both crash in to Orkney. So a little bit, I want to start by talking a little bit about uh, pilgrimage and Orkney as a macrocosm. Um, this is a picture taken by my husband. It actually got a runner-up prize in a competition run by Historic Scotland. This was taken at midwinter solstice at sunrise a couple of years ago at the Ring of Brodga. Um, a little light on the really weird light um, and Orkney itself seems to exert a bit of a siren call. Lots of people move here. Uh, and they kind of like, when you ask them why, they just say, well, I just had to. And people, when they're on holiday here, they'll say, there's a really very strange light here indeed. Um, 
we're at 59 degrees north, so the sun never ever gets directly overhead, not even at midday in midsummer. We nearly always have the sun at a really weird angle, and that gives us very, very strange light. Um, sometimes it seems like the light duckwood in quality and it drapes itself over standing stones and wildflowers like a wash of honey. Um, and sometimes it's the stones and the wildflowers themselves which appear to emit the light. They don't just reflect it from the sun. And the whole landscape appears lit up. It just The landscape just glows and pulses light and everything becomes transfused and transformed. And at those times, it's like stepping into another world, um, a sort of an ethereal other world, one where you don't actually need to eat or drink at all. You just need to breathe and where all your illnesses are healed and all your worries just drift away and you are utterly lost in the moment. Now, I'm an Orkney guide um, and I'm very much aware that many people come to Orkney, not just on holiday, but as quasi pilgrims. Um, and they often combine a holiday, sometimes a business trip with a spiritual quest. Now, many of these pilgrims are what you would call wandering pilgrims. They've got no set objective in mind. They're literally just rolling up, infused by hope that they will be guided to the right places for them. Others do come as initiatory pilgrims and they're hoping that they will be transformed during the process of pilgrimage through being exposed to sacred sites. For all these spiritual pilgrims, however, the focus of their pilgrimage is usually on the site, not the journey. There's a lot of time or cost constraints, which often necessitate a dedication to the process of pilgrimage as this accumulatory spiritual it is for those walking the really famous linear routes like the Camino, for example. So the pilgrimages to Orkney tend to be about people visiting sites and tuning into them. They're not so much focused on the act of walking, which is often considerable distances on traditional pilgrimage from one place to another. Um, but it is still very much possible to be a pilgrim because as you all know, being a pilgrim is an attitude which can be applied to all activities in life. The foci for spiritual pilgrims in general are those places which tend to be renowned as being thin. Thin is a word that we tend to use to describe those places where the veil between this mundane world and the other world is more permeable and where the other world seems to be more accessible. And these sites include places of natural beauty, archaeological sites like the Lingabrugga, and sites which have acquired a reputation for thinness, as well as shrines and holy sites associated with religions. And they're often places which have a sense of wonder about them, places which are really easy to imagine being particularly favoured by God. And I've put God in inverted commas because I kind of like, I'm not that happy with the word, but there isn't another word that's good enough to replace all the things that that word can mean. There seems to be a universal and global belief that God favours certain places over others. And these seem to have got a reputation for being sacred places, places where God is more likely to manifest and communicate. And these more open and supernaturally accessible places enable people to partake in the sacred more readily. Whenever a location acquires a reputation for being more favoured in this way, it tends to become a place where people will seek to attend and possibly to gather and to worship. The place's favoured status then tends to get further endorsement and sanctification. Now, in actuality, I suspect that no place is more favoured by God than any other place. And I also believe that you can make a place, we all can, more favourable by the way that we choose to behave there. Um, and this means that we might be able to create holy space, infinite quantities of it, 
if only we choose to do so. I find this a revolutionary idea, but other people have already said it today, this morning. Pilgrimage is a metaphor for life. In many ways, pilgrimage is a condensing of the journey of our lives. It can reflect ourselves back to ourselves. When we bring intent and openness to any experience, we can open ourselves to insight and wisdom. Religious pilgrims expect the miraculous to occur. In the Middle Ages, they were guaranteed a miracle at the end if they had done everything correctly. Spiritual pilgrims can and should expect the miraculous too. In many ways, the dozen years that I've spent in Orkney today has been a form of extended pilgrimage. But I want to talk now quite briefly about two very specific acts of pilgrimage that I've undertaken. One with purpose and intent and one by accident. This is the one by purpose and intent. This is a traditional lineage pilgrimage uh, in Orkney. Um, the pictures came off this website rather than being taken by my husband. Um, and this is uh, the St Magnus Way. Most of the really famous pilgrimage routes are linear and they take the form of physical movement through a geographical landscape via a predetermined route. Pilgrims usually have a conscious perception of the landscape through which they're moving, as well as an awareness that they are progressing through it. There may be additional sub-sacred places along the route which mark the way, and they build a sense of progression towards a final destination. The pilgrimage route itself becomes a methodology for ensuring that when the final destination is reached, any conditions will have been met. The sort opening of the thinness sacred will occur. Now, when I first moved to Utney, I really had a desire to do a walking pilgrimage. I don't know why, I just did. Now, if you really want to, you could be a, an anthropologist and you could say, ah, oh, that's the longing or the calling stage of pilgrimage, because there's stages of pilgrimage that are fully recognized. But I wouldn't want it to elevate it to that. I just wanted to do it. Part of the appeal of pilgrimage for me is that it is an anarchic act and it still remains an anarchic act. It hasn't been repealed. And my spirituality is a really anarchic one. I really question authority. It's why I don't really fit in in many places. <laughs> in 1581, which is about 40 years after England, the Scottish Reformation, which was a lot less bloody than it was in England, but it was still fairly nasty, it made pilgrimage an a punishable offence. Before then, in the Middle Ages, Orkney was really, the exact routes are now lost and it's only the destinations that are known. This is Magnus Cathedral. This is was the destination uh, for the pilgrims. Um, in 2017, I had the opportunity of walking one of the newest routes in the, in, in the UK, which was the St Magnus Square. It was created then, and it was opened in 2017. Um, you have probably never heard of St Magnus, so I'm going to give you a succinct summary of the story, which is taken from the Orkney Inga saga, which is the saga of the Norse elves of Orkney, which was written down in Iceland about 1200 AD. About 900 years ago, and most calculations favour the 16th of April, 1117, hence 2017 is 900 years after the event. But the Orkney Inga saga is not too specific about this. There was a Norse Earl, Magnus Erlison, and he was the joint Earl of Orkney with his cousin Hakon. And Magnus was murdered on the Orkney island of Egglesley, which you can see on the map, just about here, on the orders of his cousin Hakon, who was the joint Earl. At the time, Magnus's body was buried on the spot, and then it was taken to the church in Bursley, which you can see to the left, top left of the map, um, and it was then people started to report miracles. In 1135, Magnus was canonised and the 16th of April became his feast day. But as part of Norse political machinations, his nephew, Matthew, uh, Magnus's nephew, St Ronald, um, he built St Magnus Cathedral 
to house Magnus's relics, and Magnus's bones were translated from Bursa to Kirkwall sometime after 1137. Now, in the Middle Ages, Magnus was a very popular saint, and in total, there are 21 churches in Europe dedicated to him. He's the patron saint of Orkney, the blind, and the insane. You make of that whatever you want. And the Orkney Inga Saga lists dozens of healing miracles ascribed to him, both at Bursa and Kirkwall. This is St. Magnus Cathedral in Kirkwall. Um, it was a very important reliquary church um, in Scotland. Um, it made Magnus's relics accessible while at the same time providing security for them. And there was enormous wealth gifted as offerings by pilgrims. When, and you need to imagine that if you're a pilgrim in the Middle Ages, you've walked for miles, um, at least 20 miles from Bursi. You go into St. Magnus Cathedral, your senses would have been absolutely assaulted by a riot of rich decoration, candlelight statues, wall hangings, tomb effigies, incense, smelling, singing and chanting. All of that would have culminated in a long anticipated arrival at the Shrine Chapel itself. It would almost have definitely brought on a psycho-spiritual experience for you, if you want to be a scientist and explain that way. It would have assaulted your senses. It would have created a shock and almost certainly a psycho-spiritual experience. You can tell I've been trained as an archaeologist, can't you, the way I'm talking and hedging my bets all the way. <clears throat> there would have been an overwhelming experience and lots and lots of um, miracles have been reported at the cathedral. If I could have the next slide, please. And I don't, I'm trying to do that without sounding like um, Boris. So starting in Easter 2017, the St. Magnus Way was opened in five stages. You can see the stages there, they're in five different colours, okay? And they were based on the route that the body and relics of St. Magnus may have taken to their final destination. Now, the whole pilgrimage route was, and the idea was instigated by the Reverend David McNeish of the Church of Scotland, but input also came from other Christian ministers, as well as historians and the communities of Orkney. And each stage of the pilgrimage is between 10 and 12 miles long, and each was launched roughly a month apart. Each stage has a theme, and in order, the meditative themes are loss, growth, change, forgiveness, and hospitality. And these are all drawn from the story of Magnus's life. And participation on the pilgrimage was invited from people of all faiths and none, which is how come I got to go. Now, walking this pilgrimage was not physically pleasant. It was really hard work. Um, a lot of these paths were not made up and they were treacherous. And like a demented religious PE teacher, the Reverend McNeish used to periodically and cheerfully encourage us with, by shouting out, pilgrimage is not meant to be easy. Now at various times, it snowed, it hailed and it rained. It mainly rained because it is Orkney. Once when it was sunny, it was too hot and I got sunburnt and dehydrated. I fell over far more times than I can remember and I was electrocuted on a cattle fence once. I came to with other pilgrims stepping over me saying, oh, is the fence live? At every stage, despite promising myself that I wouldn't, as soon as I got to a certain critical level of being uncomfortable, cold, wet and exhausted, I did what I do. I put my head down, I isolated myself and I just pushed on. So what did I learn from walking the St. Magnus Way? I learned that I love an easy life. Basically, I'm a hobbit. I don't like being uncomfortable. I don't like being made to endure suffering or push to achieve something. I actually also quite like being miserable and on my own. And sometimes I purposely make myself socially unattractive so that I can be alone. And then I blame everybody else for leaving me alone and ignoring me. Now, these are patterns of behavior that I recognize from some of my very earliest childhood memories. My parents, I was an only child. My parents called it sulking and I did it whenever I wasn't the center of attention or I wasn't being treated like a special little princess. 
Not once did I take anything with me on pilgrimage to share with others, not even a little packet of sweeties. I did think of doing so, but then I dismissed the idea. I just took enough for myself alone. Yet people shared things with me and I took from them without ever giving back. Pilgrimage is a mirror. Mirrors are not always very pleasant to look into. Magnus's miracles often involve cures for blindness and insanity. Walking the St Magnus way helped me to more fully see myself and to recognize the madness that pervades my approach to this life. I learned to appreciate the kindness of strangers, the hospitality of Orkney's churches and the reality of God working through some people's lives. These weren't circular routes, they were linear and I didn't walk a return journey. I had to arrange lifts and car sharing with others. Some of these others were friends and some were strangers and some were people who I literally just had to beg because otherwise I couldn't get back to my car and then there's no way home. I learned how great a cup of tea can taste and how great the promise of a cup of tea can be to spur one on to finish Hobbit. In walking this newly created route, there was certainly a sense that we were doing something very pioneering and exploratory. We were opening the way. There was a feeling we were walking a route to create it, to explore it, to imbue it with holiness and to claim it in some way for pilgrimage. We were creating a sacred place, an archery through the land, a thinner place, both literally and metaphorically. We were walking with a particular intention and we were praying into it. And by walking through an area which I had often driven through, I entered into a new intimacy with the landscape itself. One which I think you can really only achieve on foot by immersion with the land. But all of this is a really modern attitude to pilgrimage. A medieval pilgrim would walk either in hope of a healing miracle or to expiate sin, and they get some time off purgatory to save their immortal souls. I wasn't walking for those reasons. I walked to learn about myself, to have some camaraderie and hopefully gain some wisdom. And I was a bit cautious about intruding on a Christian event when I'm not a Christian. I'm not anti-Christianity, I'm just not a Christian. And I, but I was coming from an interfaith background and I was intending to be fully respectful. I don't have any trouble venerating St Magnus. I'm a polytheist and there's always room for one more. But an unintended consequence of walking the St Magnus way was that I entered into a different relationship with the idea of saints and with St Magnus himself. Now, saints relics are never moved. The term that the church uses is that they are translated across the landscape. The word translated comes from the irregular Latin verb, which means to, to carry, latum, and it actually means to carry across. But there are really obvious links with language. We often say that something is lost in translation. Likewise, with relics, the more that they get geographically translated through the landscape, the more that the saint moves away from the mundane. Their relics become more holy and more sacred and more otherworldly. But despite being holy and other, saints are also intensely rooted in place and they're bound up with geographical identity and everyday homely needs. Magnus is an Orkney saint and his power is mainly sourced and centered in Orkney. Um, I could tell you loads of stories and if I've got time at the end, remind me to tell you the story of the regurgitating wolves because it's brilliant, right? But basically, once upon a time, according to their hagiographies, there was a young Norwegian servant girl praying to St Olaf, who is the patron saint of Norway. And instead, Magnus appears because Olaf is busy. So, saints are little, saints are local. Their intercessions typically provide outward protection against political threats. Saints are for the people. They are accessible. And these days, perhaps much more than ever, we all need spirituality to be accessible, to meet us halfway as we strive and we reach. 
And so I did, and I still do on occasion, pray to St. Magnus as another layer of local and available supernatural power. Now, apparently before the 20th century, a lot of scholars just didn't think that Magnus existed ever. They thought he'd been invented because his story mirrored that of Jesus Christ too much. And they thought he'd been invented as a Christ metaphor for Orkney that was more relatable to for Orkney people. And they also assumed that if he had existed, any bones in his shrine would have just been chucked out at the Reformation. But in 1919, some workmen were working in the cathedral on a pillar and they found a wooden box containing some human bones hidden in it in the cathedral um, and they're still there. The skull had a hole in it, which was fairly characteristic of a mortal axe wound, which is the way that Magnus was martyred. But it's really nice to think that he never left his cathedral. He's always there and he's holding Orkney in his hands and protecting us. And now finally, I give back. I've taken voluntary responsibility for a small part of the St. Magnus Way, and I'm what's called a peacekeeper, P-I-E-C-E. -E, and I look after a piece of St. Magnus Way between Refuge Corner and Finstown, which, and I check that the paths are still accessible every so often. And part of the path that I look after passes around Loch, Walsdale Loch, which became an intense geographical focus for me during lockdown. I want to now talk about cyclical pilgrimage um, uh, and as a microcosm. And this is my lockdown walk, which as they might be saying at the beginning, um, they'd read the article I, I wrote about this. So although pilgrimage tends to be thought of as an instrumental and linear practice, it doesn't necessarily need to be. And last year's restrictions associated with COVID-19 accidentally led me to explore the initiatory potential of pilgrimage when it's applied in a cyclical manner to a very distinct piece of land. Now near to where I live in West Mainland Orkney is Rosdale Lock. Now this has a small crannog on it and you can see that in the picture and that's got some stone ruins on it. For those of you who aren't archaeologists, a crannog is an artificial island usually attached by a raised stone path which you can see in the picture and the earliest ones date from the Bronze Age about 4,000 years ago, but that's being pushed back and it's now probably the Neolithic. These stone ruins at Wasdale have never been accurately dated. They could be the remains of an Iron Age Broch Tower, which is about 2,000 years old. Although the most persistent local tradition states that the low walls are all that is left of a very early medieval chapel. But very similar multi-period sites such as this exist elsewhere in Orkney. And one example is St. Treadwell's Rock on the island of Papa Restray. Now, I don't get an opportunity to visit Wasdale very often. Normally, my summers are really hectic. They're just a whirlwind of non-stop tourist guiding. And Orkney's dark winters like today are not the times when I really want to go for a long walk along made, unmade up paths. Lockdown changed all of that. I wasn't busy in summer, nobody wanted a tourist guide. And at one point at the beginning of lockdown when the restrictions were at the highest, um, we were only allowed to have one walk a day, so long as it was no more than 500 meters from home. And this loch was wholly accessible by footpath and it was just in 500 meters. So I started a practice of visiting most days. And this rapidly became a daily priority around which the rest of my day revolved, although this was totally unintentional. It wasn't so much that I was called to do this, it was more that circumstances conspired so that I would comply. And on those days when the weather was inclement, it became necessary to apply discipline to the task. And these are all qualities associated with the pilgrim and pilgrimage. In walking the same route, over and over again, I gradually built up a relationship with the path and the place, the plants, the animals and the birds, all the non-human people. I picked up litter and I left offerings, usually these were home bakes. I noticed how the wildflowers changed with the seasons. They always come out in a certain order of blooming, which is yellow, white, then purple. I watched hares boxing. I counted their leverets. 
I was observed by a pair of ravens who raised four fledglings and the family still buzz me when I visit. They buzzed me the other day when I went out to see them. They've all become accustomed to anticipating and then tidying up my offerings. I played poo sticks with my husband when we crossed over the burn that carries the loch waters out through Binscalf Woods and down to the Bear Fur. I saw trout jumping for flies and once I saw an eel wriggle. Every day in summer on leaving a cormorant passed overhead. It, had, it was almost like it had been cued to do so like a natural screensaver. I've come to think of these fellow inhabitants as brother fish and sister bird and mentally I greet them as such. I mourned at the carcasses that we sometimes found, the little flurry of feathers that screamed of a sudden ending and I experienced the good, which is butterflies, and the bad, which are horse flies, and I recognise them all as being part of the whole. And being an archaeologist, married to an archaeologist, we research the layers of the past like a palimpsest in the landscape, readable if you know what to look for. We searched for parish boundaries on old maps, and then as the barley ripened, we saw them appear as crop marks in the fields. We looked for and found four of the Harry Firth parish boundary stones, one of which is the Harry Firth Stennis stone. And we investigated the old workings for the weir, now broken, so only rainfall determines the level of the loch quarters. And we snooped around some World War II foundations, which led in turn to a fresh appreciation of the topography and an understanding of how the valley would once have been perfect for positioning an anti-aircraft gun. As the year turned to winter, walking was less of a treat and more of a chore. It's much easier to give in to the comfort of a wood fire and a dram of whiskey. But I needed to get out into the fresh air and there was a realisation that what was, what was entertainment for me was an issue of survival for my Corvid brethren. When it snowed, I was able to identify hair tracks and realise just how active they still were, even though I was only seeing them rarely. The quiet of the dead month of January was shattered by the plaintive calls of hooper swans and the anguished pleeps of oyster catchers. Occasionally my presence inadvertently alarmed a pheasant or a flock of grey lag geese panicking into the air and at such times I apologised for disturbing them. Everything seemed so much stiller in winter as if it's sleeping but it's so obviously just waiting. There's a nagging potentiality in the air, a keenness to awaken. Now this activity became an accidental pilgrimage. It's a chronological act of devotion rather than a linear one. Gradually, every part of the pilgrimage became imbued with sacredness as I opened to the possibilities of encountering the spiritual via an increasingly animistic perspective. Now, there's a thing about traveling to an island by crossing over water. It's really intense. And when you're traveling to an island within an island, it's even more so. There's a really traditional theme in global folklore that crossing water represents a point of transformation. You might think of the myths associated with the ferrymen of the dead, the belief that witches cannot pass flowing water or the creation of henge ditches and medieval moats. Water has long been used to divide space. So I treat the causeway as an initiatory challenge by which I enter into sacred space. I name particular stones as threshold or holding stones. And as I walk, I cross, I leave the concerns of the world behind and I wade into sanctuary. I perceive the Cranach itself as a symbolic microcosm of Orkney's macrocosm. I performed repetitive ritual acts here, including prayer, asking specifically for protection for Orkney during the pandemic. Now, I know that's selfish, but I'm kind of like, I'm aware of my limitations. Now, this repeated dedicatory process seemed reciprocated by an increasing awareness of the sanctity of the land itself. The land is a sentient and sacred entity whether referred to as genius Loki, land spirits, the angels that were being spoken about this morning, or land whites if you want to go north, or even local saints. And all of these senses of sanctity smolder under, over and around us. And this focus spatial adventure was transformed into a pledge of service in a form of non praetorial guardianship. One doesn't go on pilgrimage to somewhere, one goes on pilgrimage. 
The journey and the return are as important as the destination. You never may never get to the destination and you may never return from your destination. And if you do return, you will almost certainly not be the same. The motives of pilgrims have always been and they remain varied. But in general, the difference between a pilgrimage and a mundane journey is that on pilgrimage, every part of the journey becomes imbued with sacredness. And there's an intention of awakening and opening to spiritual encounters with the potential that on return, life might be different. Now, I work in tourism as a guide, and this is, I'm fully aware that as a green, most tourism is unsustainable. Tourism as it's presently offered commodifies the landscape. I have to thank Louise Coe for that term. There have been times when I felt that I've been pimping Orkney when taking a party around who just want to be entertained, but who don't really have any appreciation for where they are or how special it is. I'm not sure what the future holds, but I do wonder if in a decade's time, foreign travel will revert entirely to the exclusive preserve of the wealthiest. Holidays today are used as a carrot for too many people to get through their mundane lives or jobs that they don't like or don't fulfill them. And if travel no longer becomes affordable, there's quite likely to initially be protest. Tourism is a mass employer and contributor to the economy. And not all of us can afford to retrain to be coders. I'm going to be more optimistic. If we're all forced to take staycations, true staycations, where we stay at home and we go out for the day walking or cycling, if we become much more restricted geographically in general, perhaps then we will all appreciate our locality more because we'll have to. Parks and amenity areas might become more valued. And if any places can be rendered more sacred by the way we choose to behave here, there, and if we're able to create holy space, infinite quantities of it, if only we choose to do so, perhaps we'll start doing so at home or wherever we are now in this moment. And if we do, this is going to be revolutionary in so many ways. Well, thanks very much indeed, Helen. So glad you uh, went through the micro pilgrimage around your local Cranach that was so resonant with me 12 months ago now, I think it was. Really um, brought it all back and to have it read live was just uh, uh, very moving. Thank you for that.